Hey, welcome back everyone. So we're gonna be looking at Airbnb stock today. We'll take a look at some of their financials and then we will run a DCF analysis on the company so that we can try to find its intrinsic value. Now, if you'll join me on the screen here, the first thing we're gonna do is just take a basic look at some of the financials here and see if they're going in the direction we would want them to go. So if you start here, you have 2017, and for the last five years, we've had revenue go from about 2.5 billion all the way up to in 2021, 5.9 billion, basically about 6 billion. Now, if you'll take notice here in 2019, it was about 4.8 billion, and then it dropped way off in 2020, to about 3.3 billion. So COVID affected a certain basket of stocks and some stocks it highly benefited. And in Airbnb's case, it was one of those stocks for 2020 that was heavily affected on their financials because of COVID. Remember that for most of 2020, people were on lockdown, they didn't wanna go out. So yeah, you know, the essentials for like stocks that basically sold you products like Amazon and grocery stores and stuff did really well financially and were lifted up. But then you had a stock like Airbnb, a company like Airbnb, which took a pretty big hit financially in 2020. People were on lockdown. They weren't going out. They were doing only essential things. They certainly weren't spending their extra money airbnb and, you know, going on vacations and whatnot. So as you can see, the revenue took a big dip, but came right back up in 2021. And if you look at everything else, you can see operating income back here was slightly positive. It went back to negative. My assumption would be due to growth. This is where, you know, Airbnb, you know, as a company really wanted to continue to scale. So that affected their operating income. But then in 2020, it was the worst it had ever been again. That's because they had to eat a big loss because they just didn't have as much business. Now for 2021's year, the operating income went back to positive of 429 million. If you look at the net income, it's pretty much the same story where it looks pretty good now in 2021. They're close to this not even being in the negative. But if you look at the year 2020, it was the worst year they've had for net income. So basically, when I look at a company like this, I am okay with not even paying attention to the year 2020. I'm okay with throwing the year 2020 out the window when evaluating a stock like this because their company was one that really took a big hit due to COVID, and I don't think it's a true representation and true reflection of their business. So overall, excluding 2020, revenue's done nothing but go up. If you exclude 2020, their operating income has gone up. Now, net income was actually lower in the year 2018 and 2017 compared to 2021. Uh, my guess on that is going to be just the cost of scaling the business. But I'll show you in a second that they are really starting to get very much closer to actual like profitability. They do have free cash flow positive already. And if you even look at the EPS, it's much better than back in 2019, but it actually was worse than 2020. And this is because they diluted their shares. Now, obviously, we've talked about this. This is not something we want to see when a company dilutes its shares. And they did more than a double share dilution over here on the uh, shares outstanding. Now, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but Airbnb IPO'd in the year 2020. And I believe that the shares outstanding and the share dilution was just because they IPO'd and it was all accounted for in the year 2021. Now, when I was reading the financials before, I did notice there's a small amount of stock-based compensation that could attribute to dilution, but there's no way that they did that much stock-based compensation to dilute more than double the shares. So correct me if I'm wrong and you know better in the comments, uh, let me know, but 
I believe that this more than doubling of shares outstanding had to do with their IPO. So there's, it's going to make it look like there's a level of dilution when you IPO a company. But we will have to keep our eyes open in the future, uh, you know, future quarters and future years to see if any sort of further significant dilution takes place. Now, if we actually hop over to their financial statement here on the earnings that they had for Q1 2022, uh, you know, you can see a, a lot of really phenomenal growth here. Q1 of 2021 was 886 million, and Q1 of 2022 is 1.5 billion. Now, this is a point I wanted to make when we were looking at that quick look at the financials on macro trends before. Their net loss in Q1 of 2021 was 1.1 billion, and now the net loss has dropped all the way to only negative 18 million. Now, of course, we do need to watch out for future quarters and future years. You can't base it just off of one quarter over quarter to decide, oh, they're definitely, you know, getting away from these net losses. However, this is a really good sign to go from a net loss of 1.1 billion in Q1 2021 to only have a net loss of about 18.7 million in Q1 of 2022. Now, before we run our model, we have to come up with both a revenue growth rate, as we know, and a free cash flow margin to apply to projected revenues. That way we can get projected free cash flows into the future. So first thing we have to stumble upon is a revenue growth rate. Now your average analysts are thinking that the year 2022 overall is going to be a growth of about 37% but then they do feel that it'll drop off to about 21% for the following year. We should also look at the compound annual growth rate for the last, I'm gonna say four years, because I'm excluding the year 2020. We already decided in this video, you can't really count that year. It's not fair to them as 2020 is not really a true reflection of their business and growth. So I ran a compound annual growth rate on the last five years, excluding 2020, and the growth on average was about 23.6%. Now, I think all things considered, especially since the average analyst is expecting really good growth for this year, 37% on average they expect. I think it's fair to assume on average for the next five years, 20% growth. Okay, everyone, now we need our free cash flow margin to apply to projected revenues. Now, if you look at the free cash flow margin for the year 2021, it's about 36%. Now, it's hard to say that that sort of margin would continue, improve, stay the same, maybe come down a little. Trailing 12 months free cash flow margin is about 41.5%. And if we jump over to the screen here, they've got a little statement on page 26 of the earnings uh, talking actually about free cash flow. So for Q1 of 2022, the free cash flow was about 1.2 billion, representing 79% of the revenue. So their free cash flow margin in the year 2022 Q1 is 79%, which is like ridiculous, but we'll get to why it's that high. Now compared to Q1 2021, and it was about 600 million, representing a 67% free cash flow margin. The increase was driven by revenue growth. So as you can see, 79% versus 67%. Now here's your reason right here as to why Q1 tends to have a very high free cash flow margin for this business. Due to seasonality, the first quarter typically benefits from working capital is unearned fees are generated by bookings, but not yet recognized as revenue until future periods when guests check in. So all that really means is it makes their free cash flow look really good because they're taking all of those unearned fees, which boost their working capital, which boosts the free cash flow, yet they cannot book the revenue yet on their financials for Q1 because the guests have not yet checked in. What this kind of basically means is all the fees you're making, you're kind of counting it, well, towards your free cash flow for Q1, yet you're not counting the revenue yet. So what we should expect to see in future quarters is that your free cash flow will actually be lower 
but your revenue will be higher as they will start booking that on the check-ins. This would certainly explain why Q1 could literally amount for half of what the free cash flow was for the year 2021. Now, even though the numbers are a little distorted when it comes to free cash flow and revenue for Q1 2021 and 2022, and pretty much any Q1s you're going to look at for this company, that free cash flow margin is distorted, but there is a really good key point that makes me feel very good in terms of looking at their free cash flow. Q1 of 2022 was 79% versus 67% a year ago. Meaning even though Q1 is normally very high, the margin got even better. That's a very good thing to see. All in all, I believe that they can keep relatively the same free cash flow margin they had in 2021, if not make it better as Q1 has already shown that it is. Now, I think in the effort of trying to be a little conservative still, we'll go with a flat free cash flow margin of 30% over the next five years. By the way, before I continue on, I forgot to show you guys the um, gross margins because they're incredible for this business, which is a really phenomenal sign that you will indeed be very profitable into the future. Remember, revenue minus cost of goods sold gives you your gross profit. And then your gross margins are gross profit divided by revenue. For these years 2017 to 2020, your gross margins are 75%, which is incredible. That's like tech stock margins. And compared to some tech stocks, it's even way better. And then if you look at the gross margin for 2021, we're not going to whip out the calculator, but the gross margin for 2021 is actually 80%. That is just insane. Okay, everyone, let's go ahead now and continue on to the model. So here we go. So applying a revenue growth rate of 20% over the next five years, we grow out to about 14.9 billion in revenue by the year 2026. Then we apply a free cash flow margin of 30% that we came up with to projected revenues to get projected free cash flows. 2026 ends up at about 4.4 billion. We come up with a terminal value by applying a weighted average cost of capital and perpetual growth rate. I get my WAC from Finbox.com. Once we have our terminal value and, of course, all of our projected free cash flows, we need to discount them by our rate of return, our discount rate we want to use. I like to use a rate of return of 12%. And once we have all the discounted values, we add all of them up then divide by shares outstanding, and our intrinsic value comes to 125.03, or let's just call it about $125 in fair value. So there you have it, folks. According to the model, Airbnb is currently worth about $125 a share. Last I looked, they were at about $120 a share, so they're basically right at fair value. They're a little undervalued, but basically right at fair value. Now I do want to talk things that I like about Airbnb. I just want to review. I like that they're still growing very nicely. I like that the gross margins for this business are very high, 75% uh, for like the previous four years. And then for 2021, it was 80%. So uh, that's a fantastic gross margin history. Remember, the higher your gross margins are, that leaves a lot more room for you to be profitable. I like that in this last earnings, quarter over quarter, the net income is getting very close to positive. And I didn't mention it before in the video, but all the analysts are expecting year 2022 and beyond to be positive earnings per share. It just seems to me like they're definitely moving in the right direction. The things I don't like is there is a level of share dilution in stock-based compensation, but I don't believe it's going to be very significant. And that huge amount of share dilution in 2021, I'm almost positive, and correct me if I'm wrong down in the comments, I do believe that large amount of share dilution accounted for in 2021 had to do with the IPO of Airbnb. The other thing I'm not a huge fan of is that in terms of looking at a free cash flow margin, um, there's not a lot of consistency for other years that support it. So as an investor, we would want to see that they can maintain this free cash flow margin being above 30% 
in future years. Again, according to the model, it is technically slightly undervalued, pretty much right at fair value. And I forgot to mention one other thing I really do like about the business model a lot is I believe they have an enormous moat. I don't know of any competition that has an ecosystem like Airbnb does. If you're going to try to rent out on your own, then you try to rent out on your own. But in terms of trying to rent your home out as a vacation, Airbnb has a fantastic ecosystem. I've, I've used them before. And they have what I would say is a phenomenal moat, which means that that's going to allow them to continue to grow into the future. Okay, so let me know your thoughts down below on Airbnb stock in the comments. Let me know if it's a stock you own, if you do believe it's a buy. I personally think that it looks like a strong enough business where it actually is fairly compelling to buy it, even though it's only at pretty much fair value according to this model. Of course, if you think the growth will be much greater or that you think a higher free cash flow margin could be applied, then it definitely is much more undervalued than what this model is currently showing. And it's hard to tell because there's not really any sort of business model that's quite like Airbnb. I have no idea where this free cash flow margin could end up in the long run because there's no business model that's mature enough to compare it to. I mean, who knows? They've got such a moat and such high gross margins, this free cash flow margin in the next few years could end up at like 40% or more. I personally would say, according to the model, this is really not that bad of a buy right now. Because if you believe that things could get much better than the model I ran, then there's probably um, quite a bit of room for some reasonable upside potential. Okay, everyone, that's all I've got for you in this video. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.